Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Tonight, what I'd like to do is to just kind of take an informal stroll through the Word of God concerning prayer. Now, when it comes to prayer, one question that I get from time to time is, why hasn't God answered my prayer? And I think uh, what we need to do at that point is go back to the source and ask ourselves, how am I praying? What am I praying? Am I praying correctly? Does it matter how I pray? After all, many people feel that prayer is just talking to God. But it is so much more than that. Technically, when we pray, we're asking for something. Now, a lot of people say that they, uh, they like to pray for fellowship, and praying for fellowship is fine, but if you're praying to God for fellowship, and you're telling Him how wonderful He is, and how great He is, in reality, you're not praying, you're worshiping. And so that's why many times we connect prayer and worship. So worship is when we talk to God and tell Him that he's magnificent, that there is no one like him, that he is the greatest of all greats, that we honor him, we submit to him. When we talk to him that way, whether we're singing or whether we're talking, because I know that some of you out there, and I'm not going to look at anyone in particular, but some of you can't sing, and I know that because I stood next to you during church. So that, that was humor, all right, but it was true. <laughs> so when we say to God how wonderful he is and we talk to him about his magnificence, in reality, we're worshiping. And he is not that concerned about how accurate your voice is if you're singing. Someone who can sing better than someone else does not necessarily connect with God better than you. It has to do with your heart. It has to do with your words and, and how you feel. Let's take a look at John 15, 7. It says, Jesus said this. He said, if you abide, and remember the abide word means continue. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, what this does here with this verse is it puts a condition on your asking. And once again, there are those who say, are you sure that prayer is asking? Well, the very word means to ask. I don't know if you've ever watched an old English movie and someone goes into the king and they say, I pray thee, O king. Well, what do they mean? I'm coming to ask you something. So, when we go to God, he, he knows everything. And compared to Him, we, we don't. And so He has all knowledge. So we go to Him and we ask Him for wisdom. We ask Him for knowledge. We ask Him for understanding. We ask Him for healing. Even though He's already provided it, we still ask. And, uh, but it says here, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask anything. And we'll qualify that later. But you can ask anything and you'll get it. Well, somebody may say, I ask for a situation and I don't feel I got an answer. Well, let me ask you something. Were you abiding in his word and was his word abiding in you? Now, that doesn't mean that you get up in the morning and you start reading your Bible and you read your Bible till you go to bed that night. That's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about do you... Do you take his word seriously? Do you take his word as truth? And do you continue in believing in his word without doubting? Do you abide in my word? Do you abide in what I say? Okay, good. 
then ask whatever you want. And you'll receive it. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Now, of course we know, we know, that you have to ask something that's His will. You can't just ask for a jet airplane. It doesn't mean you can't ask for a jet airplane, but you can't just ask for something that you want. You can't just ask for a new shiny guitar that you see or something. You can't just ask for something that you want, although, unless what you're wanting parallels what he's wanting. And you'll find that most of the time, what he's wanting is something that will produce salvation for people. He's wanting something that's going to change lives. Now, if you having something that you desire is also going to be something that's going to change lives, then it probably parallels God. And there are some things that God wants you to have just because he loves you. It's okay to take a vacation. It's okay to take rest. All right. In fact, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So that qualifies the Scripture we just read. You can ask for something, but it has to be for Him to hear us. It has to be according to His will. And then the next verse, verse 15, 1 John 5, 15 says, that if we know that He hears us, that's where confidence comes in, then He grants the request. So there's another qualifier. You can't be going around after you've asked God for something and say, hey, I don't know if He heard me or not. Well, you should know. If you ask something according to His will, you should know He heard you. But it's, it's not... Prayer is not just kind of like throwing it against the wall to see if it sticks. I mean, a lot of people have said, and I've heard this many times, well, I've tried everything, might as well pray. You know, it's, it shouldn't be the last resort. Prayer should be the first resort, all right? Now, you have to ask yourself this question sometimes. Why are you praying? Are you praying because you just want to check off a box with God? You know, is this something where you, by law, you have to pray five times a day at a certain time? Or two times a day at a certain time? Or are you praying because you actually love Him, you respect Him, and you want to fellowship with Him and Ask Him for the solutions to your problems. Why are we praying? You need to pray with a purpose. Now, uh, Smith Wigglesworth said one time, it, it's better to pray five minutes, I think it was five minutes, five minutes with a purpose than five hours and just meandering around. You know, it doesn't take long to ask for something. Loretta and I, we try on a daily basis, we don't always make it, but we try on a daily basis to agree together for our day that God will bless our day and He will guide us in wisdom. And we say that and we, we speak over our health and over our children and grandchildren and then we pray in the Spirit. And we pray in the Spirit for just a minute or two. Well, originally, I used to think you had to pray in the Spirit for a long time. But Loretta brought this up one day. She said, if we're sitting at the dinner table and you've got the salt and I want it, how long does it take me to say, pass the salt, please? Sometimes things are not a long, drawn-out dissertation, you don't have to preach a sermon to God to ask Him one simple question. So, with that in mind, you need to understand this. Matthew 6, 8 says that God knows 
what we want, what we need, before we even ask. Which brings up the question, if he knows what I need, if he knows what I want, why pray? I mean, he already knows. Well, let's take a look at another scripture here. James chapter 4, verse 2. It says, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, it goes on to say that sometimes you ask and you still don't receive, but that's because you ask with the wrong motives. But we have to ask. God doesn't respond to your thoughts, although your thoughts are important, but he responds to your, the voice of your word. Hmm. So when you pray, you must pray the word. I had a gentleman speak here on a Thursday night probably 20, 25 years ago. And we had an Amish lady sitting all the way in the back. And this guy gave a great sermon. And the Amish lady sent a note all the way to me. And when the guy said amen, she passed up the note. And the note said, all gong and no dinner. In other words, he was, he was out there ringing the dinner bell, but there wasn't any food on the table. You, you've got to have word in your teaching, but you have to have word in your prayer. God wants us to tell him what he's promised. He says, he says in his word, remind me. Remind me. And I know many times <laughs> my children would come to me when they were younger and they would ask me something and I would say, okay, wait, what, what did I tell you? Tell me. What did I tell you? Well, <laughs> We, we need to understand that God is kind of the same way as our Father. He's asking us, what did I tell you? What did I promise you? You know, we ask for something, and then we, sometimes we ask in such a way that it's like, well, I don't know if you want to do this or not, when He's told us in His Word that He wants to and He will. So when, when we don't ask for Him with confidence, ask from Him, with confidence, what he has already promised us by reminding him of his promise, it's, uh, it's not a, as a productive of a prayer. I always liked it when one of my children would come to me and say, uh, Dad, you told me that if I would do this, you would do this. I've done it. And I go, oh, okay. And then I would follow through with the promise. Sometimes I would wait until they came to me and acknowledged that they had done what I said to do in order to get what I said they would get. Now, we need to remember his promises. Psalm 103, 3, he heals all of our diseases. How many of your diseases? All of them except COVID. All of them except cancer. All of them except no all of them with no exceptions. What about your finances? Isaiah 48, 17 says that He is the Lord our God who teaches us to profit. And that word profit doesn't mean prophesy. That's profit. That word in the original language is to make a profit. He will teach you how to be profitable in your life. God's children, we don't flaunt riches. That's never good, to flaunt riches. But we should not be beggars. According to the Scripture, we should, be, we should have enough so that we can be lenders. Proverbs eleven twenty one: The children of the righteous will be delivered. There's a promise from God to you that your children will be delivered. Stress? What about stress? Boy, what does God say about stress? John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace, I leave with you. The peace that I give to you, that 
The world doesn't have this kind of peace. I have a peace the world doesn't have. Wow. Well, sometimes you can uh, pray things out of context. And uh, years ago, another minister and I, we were at a meeting, and he, he brought up the subject during the meeting that praying out of context was like Curly and the Three Stooges. I know that none of you are probably old enough to remember. Most of you will probably remember the Three Stooges. How many of you remember the Three Stooges? <laughs> okay. There was Larry, Curly, and Mo. And they were always doing nyet, 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 and all this and poking each other. And, and every time that uh, I think Mo would go to poke Curly in the eye, Curly would do this. And that would prevent it. And this minister said to me, he said, it's kind of like this is the word. And if you have the word in its proper place, the enemy can't get to you. But if you, you can still have the word, but if you have it out of context, you're open for the enemy. And I'm sure that that's something that Angie, the video director, will want to cut out later. Okay. <laughs> you, need to, you need to see your prayer as answered. You, you don't pray and then see your prayer as out there waiting for an answer. No, you need to visualize that your prayer is answered. Now, when it comes to vis visualization, a lot of people will say, wait a minute, that's, that's new age. No, new age stole the concept from the Bible. They have the right concept, but they have it in the wrong place. The Word of God says we should see our prayers answered before they're answered. What does that mean? You need to see yourself set free before you're free. You need to see yourself delivered before you're delivered. Now let's take a look at Mark eleven twenty four, 24, very, very well-known scripture. It says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them, and you will have them. That's Mark eleven twenty four. Now here's the here's the interesting part on this. When it says believe that you receive them, that word in the Greek is past tense. So it's basically saying believe that you have received. Now the word them. In your Bible, it may not show it on the overheads, but on, on the in your Bible, the word them is italicized. That means it was added by the translators to make it sound right. So what the Scripture actually says is, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received, and you will receive. Well, the reason he didn't necessarily translate it that way, now in some of your Bibles, it is translated correctly. But it doesn't make sense in the natural mind. Believe that you will get it, and then, or believe that you have it, and then you will get it. But that's the way faith works. You believe God's promise so much that even though you haven't received it, you bank on it, you bank on it. Now, it's kind of like, let's say for example, you needed to finish a project at your house, you needed $10,000. In order to finish something, you're going to put a patio or a porch or update the kitchen or something, and you need $10,000. And you go to the bank and you apply at the bank. So you fill out all the paperwork and you ask them for a loan. Well, you get a call from the bank a couple of days later and the bank says, your loan has been approved, a check will be in the mail to you within the next 10 days. You get off the phone, you walk in the other room, and you say to your spouse, well, guess what? We got it. We got the $10,000. No, you didn't. You got notification that it was going to come but you don't have it. They even told you you weren't going to have it 
It wasn't going to be in the mail until the next eight or ten days or whatever. But in your mind and in your words, you're saying, I've got it. Do you get that? Now, if you can put that much faith in the bank, why can't you put that much faith in God? Why can't you, when God says, you ask for this and I'll give it to you? When you ask, why can't you walk away from that prayer and believe that you already have it? Now, you know, you know, come on. Logically, you know in your mind it's, it's not there in your hand. But just like when you walked in the other room and told your spouse you had the $10,000, the bank says we have the money. Well, you know, and your spouse knows, you don't really have the $10,000 in your hand. But you both count it as done. And that's the way we need to be with God. When we ask Him for something He promised, we need to count it as done. Which means you don't go back and continually beg Him for what He's already given you. Now, what if you called up the bank the next day and said, I'd like to apply for a $10,000 loan? The banker is going to think you're nuts. He, he said, wait, you already have, and we already, we already approved it. It's on its way. Well, I don't see it yet. I don't see it yet. I don't think you answered my application. Yes, we answered your application. Everything is in process. You will be seeing the manifestation of it. The check will be in the mail in a few days. Huh. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll believe it when I see it. Because I believe what I see. Well, that's your problem. See, the world says, I'll believe it when I see it. By faith, we should say, I'll see it when I believe it. Our belief comes first. And then, what's the scripture? We talked about this last Sunday. Having done all, stand. You've made the application at the bank. You've turned it in. You've waited. The bank approved it. And now, what? There's nothing to do except just be patient. And you will see the manifestation. Unless you keep asking so much that you make, the banker starts to think that you don't really qualify anymore. And then he says, I've changed my mind. You know, look, when the Scripture says consider it all joy or count it all joy when you encounter various trials in the book of James, count it all joy. It doesn't mean it is joy, but you consider it that when you go through a trial, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, what? Patience, endurance, and, and all these good things. All right. Now, so when it comes to visualizing, we need to see ourselves delivered. We need to see ourselves set free. Hmm. We need to see your problem the way God sees your problem. How does God look at your problem? Not as a problem, He sees it as a victory. Wow. All right. It's kind of like salvation. The price has already been paid. If we had somebody that we knew that wanted to become a Christian, and we talked to them, and they said, yes, I want to receive Jesus. And I say this respectfully. Jesus does not have to climb back up onto the cross and die again for that person. Why? He's already done it. Once and for all. He paid the price. For who? For everybody. Does everyone get saved? No. Who gets saved? The ones who receive it. Likewise, He has paid the price for your healing, for your prosperity, for everything that you need in life, He has paid the price for. The Scripture says, by the stripes on His body, we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 the Scripture tells us in, in Corinthians that 
though he, now listen to this. <laughs> this bothers some people, and I apologize for bothering you, but if it bothers you, consult your Bible. The Scripture says in Corinthians that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now I know, and you know, that you can't use salvation, you can't use the gospel for your own gain. That's not the purpose. God, God is just not wanting us to be rich so that we can just spend it on our own pleasures. But I'll tell you what, if there's a godly person, a godly man or woman, and they use their money to help the poor, they use their money to fund missions, they tithe to the church, they, they do all these things, then that's a candidate for prosperity in God's kingdom. And uh, so what we're saying is, he is, here's a Bible word for you, he is our propitiation. What that means is, is he is our substitute. He died on the cross, so you don't have to die. You can have eternal life. He took sickness and disease on, infirmities and stripes on his body. Why? So you don't have to. That scripture we just read in Corinthians, it says, he took on poverty. Why? So you don't have to. The Bible says he went from town to town and village to village preaching the good news to the poor. Oh, well, what's good news to the poor? Hey, I got good news for you. You're poor. And oh, by the way, you're going to stay poor. No. Deliverance. It's like he didn't preach to the sick and say, hey, sick, line up here. I want to lay hands on you so you can stay sick. No. He preached deliverance in every area. Of course, the best part is eternal life. That's the one that sustains past this life. And that's the one we should be more focused on than anything else. We should be, we should be more focused on getting people saved. Now, take this in context. More focused on getting them saved than getting them healed or prosperous. Although, God wants, wants the full thing for all of us. But we've got to get people into the kingdom. We've got to get people born again. Okay. So, guard your words. Your mouth can get you into trouble. You know, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I always think of it this way. My life and my death are in the power of my tongue. What I say can bring life. Or what I say can bring death. What are you speaking over yourself? You say, well, I may say a few bad things about myself, but <laughs> I don't really mean it. Well, Jesus said, your idle words is what you're going to give account of. Every idle word, you'll give account of it on the day of judgment. And then he goes on to say, by your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. So our words are very important. And... Uh, you know, for someone to say, this flu is just going to be the death of me. No, no, whoa, time out, stop. Don't curse yourself like that. My feet are killing me. No, don't, look, you, you may say, well, I was just joking, that's just a phrase. Get your phrases right. If your feet hurt, it may be okay to ask someone, would you pray with me? My feet hurt. You're just telling a fact. But you're not cursing yourself. Don't get into denial either, even with God. Don't deny something. See, faith, and we need to remember this, faith is calling those things that be not as though they are. And let me give you a very simple illustration on this. If I say, by his stripes I have been healed, and I have been diagnosed with a problem, what I'm doing is I'm calling those things that be not, I've been diagnosed with a problem, I'm calling those things that be not, the healing, as what I am. By his stripes I have been healed. I am healed by faith. By faith I am healed. That's calling the thing that be not as though it is. Now to say, someone says to me, how are you doing? I'm not sick. 
And then whatever the diagnosis is, you say, I don't have that. Well, you're not calling those things that be not as though they are. You're calling those things that are as though they be not. It's, it's the reverse. There's faith, and then there's denial. And uh, I'm going to say it one more time, just so you'll remember it. Faith is believing what God says, and denial is a river in Egypt. And that helps you remember it, okay? But Stay in faith, but don't be in denial. Just claiming that you don't have something, that's, that's just denial. That's not faith. Faith is claiming God's promise. Okay. Now, uh, what you think, you know, the Bible says whatever man thinks, that's what he is. And... Uh, Sometimes you can look around at people and think, what are you thinking? That was humor also, but, but it's true. But what does Philippians 4.8 tell us? It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, what is meditation? Meditation is not necessarily, although it encompasses it, but it's not thinking. If you see somebody sitting in a restaurant, and they're just sitting there, their mouth is closed, and they're looking out the window, and they just don't move, you cannot say they're meditating. What you say is they're contemplating. They're thinking. Meditation is the slowly moving over your lips something. When you see at the Western Wall, when you see the, the people praying at the Western Wall, and you see them with their lips moving, what the, and they're they're quoting God's Word under their breath. That's meditation. What are the meditations of your heart? You know, you don't have to say things loud. You can be driving down the highway and meditate on God's Word just by saying God's promises. We need to talk to ourselves a little more. And that's basically what we're doing. We're telling ourselves what God says. So we need to meditate on good things. You cannot be meditating. You can say, that dumb guy, he just, I'm going to break his neck. If, I, if he comes around here, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to. You see, that's meditating on something wrong. Here's meditating on something good. I praise God I have good neighbors, and I praise God that even though that dog chewed up my newspaper, He's a good dog. God created that dog. <laughs> you know, you, you, you got you to gotta watch what, you're, what comes out of your mouth because by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. And uh, God hears every word you speak. You know what? Here's something you need to also understand. There's one person on this earth that hears every word you speak from morning till night. Just one. And that's you. Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear a good report. You hear what God says. And you hear it. And you hear it. And it doesn't say faith comes by hearing the word of God. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that means repetitious you hear the word of God and it gets in into your heart and then out of the abundance of your heart your mouth speaks and so when something comes along instantly what's going to come out of your heart is the word of God and and not the word of the enemy you know when your car is going over the cliff that's a good time to find out what's in your heart Now, it might not be bad to just say, help me, Jesus. 
Because within him is all the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But uh, there was a gentleman a few years ago in the Canary Islands. I don't know if you remember or not. Uh, but I think it was back in the 80s. There was a plane, a passenger plane, had a lot of people on it. And uh, it landed, and when it landed, it crashed. And the fuel from the gas tanks went through the passenger compartment, covered the people, and then it caught on fire. And uh, trying to think of the man's name right now, but uh, he had a powerful testimony. He, uh, he was on the talk shows on television, you know, CBS, NBC, and all that. And somehow, he just was inside the plane, and he just ended up in his suit, just standing on the wing of the plane. And uh, he completely survived. No smoke on him or anything. Kind of like the kids in the fiery furnace, you know. So, uh, later, it, it turned out, he had been at a, I believe it was a full gospel businessmen's meeting, and uh, he had been in a prayer meeting that morning, and supernaturally, they say, he was thrown out of the plane and ended on the wing, which he was the only one. And so I remember watching the interview on television, and the talk show host said, let me ask you something. As the people inside the plane, you, because he said he was there when they were burning, and screaming, and he said, the talk show host said, I, I would imagine that everyone on the plane was crying out to God to save them. And he said, no, he said, that's not the case. He said, all I heard was people cursing God. Cursing God. And uh, the talk show host said, why is that? And he said, you know, I wondered a long time myself why, why that would be. And he said, one time when I was in prayer, the Lord kind of revealed to my heart that the way you live is the way you die. And these people had evidently put, I don't know, let's just put it this way. If you have the love of God in your heart, you got the Word of God in your heart, and you get slapped, that's what's going to come out. If you don't, and you get slapped, cursings are going to come out. So what we put in our heart is extremely important, but what we put in our heart comes through our eye gates and our ear gates and where, where, we, where we go. So we really need to uh, check our associations. Watch out what you're watching. Now this doesn't mean that you can't listen to a secular song. I'm not talking about that. But I'm just saying... Everything needs to be in balance with the Word of God. And the scale needs to be on the God side. All right? Now, likewise, when you pray, if a person is concerned about their prayer not being answered, you have to ask yourself, am I praying in doubt? And the Bible tells us that, uh, without going into all the Scriptures, that if, if we pray in doubt... We're like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And see, doubt doesn't mean that you don't believe. It just means you don't believe all the time. It means that you believe and then you question it. And then you believe and then you question it. And that's where the, the illustration of the wave comes in. You know, uh, uh, back when I was the pastor of a Southern Baptist church, ah, okay, Back when I was the pastor of a denominational church, <laughs> there was a scripture I read that really changed me. Just one verse. Because I would always say, the word of God is always true and it always works. Nothing can change God's word from working. Nothing. And then I read this scripture, it's like, what am I going to do with this? And it's Hebrews 4.2. It said, for indeed the gospel, what's the gospel? The good news. Okay. Indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. 
But the word that they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. One version of the Bible says not being mixed with faith in the hearts of those who heard it. So God's word is true, but when we hear the word, this scripture is telling us there's two groups of people, and they both heard the word. But the word didn't profit this group, and it did profit this group. But it profited this group, and it didn't profit this group because this group didn't have faith, believing God, mixed with it. So in order for God's promises to work, when we pray, we got to not just believe that he can do it, but we need to believe that he will do it. And according to what we read a while ago, once we pray, we need to believe that he's already done it, and it's happened already. The loan's been approved, and the check's on the way. Quit worrying about it. Okay. So, uh, now, the scripture we read a while ago, Mark eleven twenty four, 24, that said, uh, when you pray, believe that you've received it, and you will receive it. The next verse says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anyone against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. Then verse 26 says, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. In other words, when you're standing there praying, believe that you received it, and you'll receive it. However, when you're standing there praying, if you've got a problem with somebody, you better get that out of your head. You better forgive them. And you might say, well, they're still acting like a jerk. That has nothing to do with it. They may be acting more like a jerk after you forgive them. It's not about them. It's about you. The forgiveness is in your heart. It has nothing to do with their heart. It has to do with your heart. So you forgive them, even if they don't want to be forgiven, even if they continue to do what they're doing, even if they're a jerk when you forgive them and they're more of a jerk after you forgive them irrelevant you have got to let it go just let it go and that will affect your prayer wow well how do i know that jesus said so okay now check your forgiving and then i'm going to just drop down to this point here don't give up on your belief that God has answered your prayer. That's why the scripture says, having done all, stand. You say, well, I prayed and nothing happened. Ah, no, no, quit it. You just nullified it. You prayed and you haven't seen anything happen, but the prayer has been answered. God has met your need. And now what you do is believe. You stand in belief, in faith, and quit worrying about what you've asked him for. If you've asked him for something that's his will, and you know it is, and you can be led by the Spirit and know it's his will, you, you know, come on, you know when you're praying for something that's your flesh or something that's his heart or his desire for you. You know. And so when you pray, then say thank you Jesus and go in and get a good book and sit down and get a cup of coffee and just relax because God's got it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. And we thank you, Father, that you answer every request that's given in faith, that's according to your will. In the name of Jesus, we love you. Amen.